Hi, I'm Nick Dalio, and I wanted to thank you for joining us right here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service is a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Christ, and that it will help you see and understand all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we would love the opportunity to pray for you. You could send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us anytime by downloading our app. Just visit the App Store and search for Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to impact your life, then we want to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app, then choose the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy today's message. You know, one of the saddest things to come out of the sickening events uh, that happened last week in Charleston, Virginia, uh, was the... Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, was the realization that apparently there are a growing number of people in this country who feel the freedom to come right out and identify themselves as white nationalists and neo-Nazis. And I don't know about you, but to me, theirs is a very sad, pathetic, evil vision of an America that has only room for white people. Whatever else anyone means by taking America back, these people take it to mean taking America back from people of color, from ethnic minorities, and from Jews. But think about, if their vision for America was ever to be realized, and there were no ethnic minorities, there were no Jews in America, there were no black, brown, or yellow people anymore, what an impoverished, sad nation we would be. And what if all there were were white Aryan people in our country, white Aryan authors, white Aryan athletes, musicians, actors, teachers, and politicians. Well, can you imagine what we've been missing? The musical genius of a Stevie Wonder, the home run power of an Albert Pujols, the thoughtful poetry of Maya Angelou, the economic brilliance of a Milton Friedman, the cello artistry of Yo-Yo Ma, the powerful rhetoric of a Martin Luther King, the jaw-dropping catches of Odell Beckham Jr., uh, the political insightfulness of a Marco Rubio, or the scientific brilliance of Albert Einstein, the grace of Michelle Kwan. As a nation, how much poorer we would be if we were only a nation of white Aryans. We're better together, aren't we? We're a nation of immigrants from all over the world and every ethnic group that has ever come to these shores has made some positive contribution to the fabric of this republic. And so anyone who tries to deny that and chooses to live in isolation from instead of engaging with those different from oneself misses out on the essence of what really is America. Now, if that's true of America, how much more so is it true of the church? of Jesus Christ. You know, I've been reflecting recently about how the Jesus that died on the cross for me had considerably darker skin than I have. He wasn't a white Caucasian, he was a Semitic man. And he didn't just die for people like himself, but for all of mankind, no matter what the skin color, red, yellow, brown, black, or white, he commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all the nations, he makes us one by virtue of his sacrifice. The book of Revelation tells us that those who worship before his throne exalt him as the one who by his blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Heaven is populated with all kinds of people. And whenever the church is at its best, it's a reflection of that kind of diversity too. We're better together. Now, if I were to put a heading to the passage of scripture we're studying today, it would be exactly that, better together. As Paul writes the conclusion of his great letter to the church at Rome, he writes from Corinth in Greece to people who are in Rome in Italy. He talks about traveling back to Jerusalem in Israel before moving on to Spain. Paul was one who knew how to cross many ethnic and national boundaries for love of Jesus. And though Jewish, he has spent the last 20 years of ministry 
primarily in ministry to Gentiles. Now here in the closing verses of Romans, he greets more people by name than in any of his other letters, which is kind of interesting because he's never been to the church at Rome. He greets 26 people by name, two others who are unnamed, brings greetings from nine other believers who are with him in Corinth as he writes. And there are two things I find especially notable about this chapter. Not looking at just a list of names, but I find first of all, there is a diversity of people who are part of the church in Rome and are numbered among his associates. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. There are Gentiles of various nationalities. There are slaves and there are rich folks. There are 17 men and 10 women who are addressed specifically by name. That in itself is very noteworthy. The other thing that I find very interesting about this passage is the sheer number of people Paul knew by name in the church of Rome, a church where he'd never been, so that you see that Paul is clearly not just a soul winner, but he's a friend maker. And in this chapter, he's a sterling example of one who clearly understood that we are better together. In fact, I think Paul would go so far as to say, when it comes to living the Christian life, don't try to do this on your own, folks. We're not meant to be Lone Ranger Christians. We don't have the luxury in the church of choosing to hang out only with people who are exactly like us. Why would we want to anyway? Paul is a tremendous example of one who understood the importance of being in relationship as he walked with Christ. He was the richer for it, and the people who walked with him were the richer for having walked with him. And so as we work our way through these first 23 verses of Romans 16, Paul, by example, shows us at least four ways that we're better together as we walk with Christ. Here's the first one. It's in verses one and two. We're better together when we open doors for each other. We're better together when we open doors for each other. Now, we're not only talking here about the excellent work of our welcome team on Sunday morning when they open the door for you to come into church. We're talking about opening doors of opportunity, opening doors of relationship for each other. The passage opens with the the Apostle Paul commending to the believers in Rome a woman by the name of Phoebe. She's from the suburbs of Corinth, a town called Sancria, and it's likely that she was the one who carried the letter from Paul to Rome. You know, Paul said, hey, Phoebe, you're going to Rome. Would you mind taking a letter from me there to the church? And, and these verses serve as a kind of introduction for her to the Romans so that they'll know who she is and will receive her warmly. And so Paul begins in this chapter by saying, I commend you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sencrea. The word servant there is literally the word deacon. This may have been just how she was known as a, a servant to the church. She was always serving people. Or it could be that she held an official title there, that she was among the deacons in the church. Deacons in the New Testament are like those who serve in our congregational care committee here. They, they care for the material and practical needs of church members. So Phoebe is somebody who is known for her service. He says, welcome her, Paul says, that you may welcome her in the Lord and in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever way she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Paul says, I want you to welcome her the way people should welcome a fellow believer, people who are commanded by Jesus himself to love each other as he has loved us, welcome her in that manner. And and I want you to know that you should give her whatever she needs, whether she needs a place to stay or whether she needs somebody to, to host her for a meal or whether she needs transportation, whatever she needs. Would you take care of her, please? Because I'm telling you, she's a special person. Uh, many other Christians who passed through Sancria have received that kind of treatment from her. I've benefited from that kind of hospitality. She has been a patron to me, which may mean that she has even sponsored Paul on one of his missionary journeys, and she's been that for other people as well, Paul says. So here's Phoebe coming to the big city, the biggest city in the empire, uh, maybe a city where she's never gone before, not knowing a soul, wondering where she'll stay, where she can find a hot meal, feeling kind of unsure of herself, maybe even afraid for her personal safety. And then she presents Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And they read this commendation of her, this request that they care for her. And the next thing you know, Phoebe's receiving the royal treatment. Why? Because she comes bearing a letter from the great apostle, from Paul. And he says she's someone deserving special treatment. Do you see what Paul has just done for her? He's opened a door of relationship for her to the church at Rome. 
She remains a stranger to them for only as long as it takes for them to get to this part of the letter and read about who she is. And from that moment on, she's taken in as part of the family. One of the ways we're better together is when we open doors for each other that way. Doors of relationship, doors of opportunity. It's a beautiful thing for me to watch a follower of Jesus introduce another believer into his circle of Christian friends. And I see it almost every Sunday morning. Hey, come over here, I want you to meet some of my friends. Or somebody came up to me at the end of service last week saying, Pastor, here's some friends of mine, they're at Bayside for the first time. I want you to meet them. You see what he's doing? He's opening a door of relationship there. Another example, it's a joy for me to write letters of recommendation for students from our church who applied to go to Christian colleges. You know, oftentimes they'll need a letter of recommendation from one of their pastors. And, and I'm already thinking about several students that I, I watch, several of our high school students that I watched during vacation Bible school and how amazingly well they served. I'm already thinking, I know I'm going to write in their recommendation letter. How I'm going to be able to say to the people at this college, you know, welcome this person into your institution. You'll be the better for it. They'll be a real asset to your campus. Or another example, last week I got a phone call from a woman who does a lot of speaking for women's retreats and conferences, and she had a, an engagement lined up for this fall, but somebody had been spreading a rumor about her that had no substance, and the pastor of the church was someone I knew who was suddenly having misgivings about whether she should come or not. Maybe she should be disinvited. And my friend asked me, would I be willing to talk with that pastor to vouch for her? And I, having known her for a long time and knowing the excellence of her work, I said, by all means, encourage him to talk with me. I'll do whatever I can to open that door for you. Be alert to opportunities you may have to be a door opener for a fellow believer, to introduce them to your friends, to use your influence to help them along. It's one of the ways we're better together than if we try to live the Christian life on our own. We're better together when we open doors for each other. Here's the second way we're better together. We're better together when we appreciate each other. We're better together when we appreciate each other. Isn't it nice to be appreciated? In fact, it's more than nice. It's practically a matter of survival. Did you know that? You can only stay in a relationship so long as you know that you're appreciated. You go into a relationship long enough feeling unappreciated and you're gonna give up on that relationship. Go long enough without feeling appreciated by anybody and you may start to wonder if the world would be a better place without you. There was a study done by the University of Georgia that was published in the Journal for Personal Relationships that concluded that the key to a happy and lasting marriage might be as simple as regularly expressing gratitude. After interviewing 468 married individuals on relationship satisfaction, covering everything from communication habits to finances, they found the most significant single uh, consistent factor predicting a happy marriage was whether one spouse expressed gratitude. Feeling appreciated and believing that your spouse values you directly influences how you feel about your marriage, how committed you are to it, and your belief that it will last. And somebody's saying, preach it, pastor. I don't feel appreciated by my spouse. <laughs> and that may be true. You may be feeling very unappreciated. But let me ask you this on the flip side. If I were to talk to your spouse and ask how appreciated he or she feels, what would, what would they say? You say, no, you're not preaching, you're meddling, stop it. <laughs> Appreciation goes a long way, doesn't it? Well, one thing Paul does really well in this passage is show appreciation to others. And, and so in verses 3 through 16, he greets 27 people, 25 of them by name, whom he has reason to believe are now part of the church in Rome. It's likely that Paul has crossed paths with them somewhere along the way in his missionary journeys, and now knowing that they're in Rome or believing them to be in Rome, he pauses to mention them by name and pass on his greetings in this letter. Can you imagine if you're sitting in church one Sunday in the church at Rome and, and the leader of the service comes up and he says, hey, we just received a letter from the Apostle Paul. We're going to read it out loud this morning. So settle in and let's hear what Paul has to say. And, and you read through the whole letter and you get to chapter 16 and the one reading the letter gets to this section and you hear your name and a personal greeting from the Apostle and in some cases additional words of appreciation. How would that make you feel? A greeting like that, words of appreciation like that would be a tremendous encouragement. Like, hey, Paul remembered me. The apostle took time to greet me by name. 
He said such nice things about me. I didn't know he, he felt that way about me. Words like that can make a huge difference in a person's life and, and be powerful motivation to help them keep walking with Jesus. And so look how Paul does this in verse three. He begins by saying, greet Prisca and Aquila, or Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their lives, uh, risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are well known to us from the book of Acts. They were Jews, Christians, who were Jewish, who were expelled from Rome in 49 AD when Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. They settled in Corinth, in Greece, where Paul happened to be also at the time. And so as believers, they connect with each other and then they find out they have something else in common. They all have tent making ability. They're tent makers and so they settle in and they start a business together making tents to develop some income, not only provide a living, but to help support Paul's ministry. And they spend some time together in Corinth, and then the three of them go together to Ephesus, where Priscilla and Aquila in particular have a profound influence on a young man by the name of Apollos. And it may be that there in Ephesus, they were the ones, Priscilla and Aquila, who provided Paul shelter when a riot broke out in Ephesus against him. And this may be what Paul is referring to when he said they risked their lives or their necks to save my life. And now he knows that they're in Rome and he wants them to know how much he appreciates them. And, and so Paul goes on to greet some others after that. Greet my beloved Epin Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Eponidas hears his name. I'm beloved by the apostle. That's cool, you know? Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Now, there are six Marys in the New Testament. We don't know which one this is or if this is a different Mary altogether. It was a very common name. But can you imagine being whoever this Mary is, sitting there in the church at Rome, uh, hearing this greeting from the apostle and, and being able to say, oh, wow, that's cool. The apostle thinks I'm a hard worker. That's encouraging. He goes on, greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, fellow Jews, and, and my fellow prisoners. They were well known to the apostles and were in Christ Jesus before me. So uh, we don't know much about these folks except that they're apparently Jewish believers who's, who somewhere along the line were thrown into prison with Paul on one of the many occasions when he was thrown into jail for preaching the gospel. And so Paul's saying, hey, I hear Junia uh, and Andronicus are there with you. Make sure you greet them. We did time together. Greet them for me. He says in verse eight, greet Impliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Uh, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachus. Greet Apellus, who is approved in Christ. All these folks saying, you know, wow, I'm, I'm a fellow worker. I'm beloved. I'm approved. Wow, that's what the Apostle Paul thinks about me. Then follow greetings to six more people about whom we know very little, but imagine their delight to be singled out by Paul for special greetings. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet my beloved Persis who has worked hard in the Lord. And then verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and also his mother who has been a mother to me as well. Some wonder if this is the Rufus who is mentioned in Mark chapter 15, whose father was Simon of Cyrene, the man who was forced by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus' cross to Golgotha when Jesus couldn't carry it anymore. And Rufus, it's believed, may have been a young man or a boy watching all this happen. Chosen the Lord, what a story he has that Paul is in essence saying here. And greet his mother as well. She was so kind to me. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That was a typical manner of greeting. You greeted each other with a kiss in those days. Paul says, make sure it's holy. Keep it pure now. All the churches of Christ greet you. Have you ever stopped to think about what a ministry you can have to other believers merely by bothering to learn their name, by stopping to acknowledge them, by greeting them, dropping them a note of encouragement, saying a few words of appreciation to them. 
We're better together when we appreciate each other. Some of you may know that my son has a ministry to at-risk youth in Levittown, Pennsylvania. It's called Treehouse. And the specific target group of this ministry is kids who are at risk for making bad choices, or maybe they already have made some bad choices, and they're at risk of making more bad choices. Maybe they're being bullied at school, or they're going through really tough times at home. And uh, by the way, we're, we're going to bring a treehouse uh, support group here to Bayside, hopefully after first of the year, right alongside of our current youth ministry to provide another layer of care to kids who are at risk that way. And if you talk to our director of student ministries, Brian, he'll tell you that that might be as many as 80% of the kids in our youth ministry. They're really at risk in, in those ways. Tough situations are going through. One of the things that happens at a treehouse support group is, is very interesting. It's a caring Christian adult who meets with a group of maybe eight or so students, and they check in. And so each student goes around and says, on a scale of one to ten, how was your week? And you can't say five because five doesn't tell you anything. You can say 4.9 or you can say 5.1, but you can't say five. And then, in addition to giving the number that kind of gives an indication of how your week is going, you're supposed to give three words that describe emotions that go along with that number. And then a student, if they want to, is able to take some additional time to talk about what's going on in their lives. And so it's this, it's this caring context where there's strict confidentiality, mutual supportiveness, kids are encouraged to stay on track and not mess around, and they're very respectful of that when the ground rules are very, very clear. But before they start sharing, they always rehearse what they call the three needs. And they say them out loud together. We are lovable, capable, and worthwhile. We are loved without strings. We are not alone. Now, can you imagine what it must mean to a kid who is in a tough situation in life, maybe they're being bullied at school or their family life is falling apart, and these words are spoken into their lives? This may be the only place in their whole week where anybody says anything positive about them, speaks into their life in a positive way, and, and they know that these are other people who support them in this fashion. It, it's a valuable thing that they provide for each other. What a valuable ministry we can have to one another by communicating these kinds of messages. I appreciate you. You're not invisible to me. I see what you do. You, you make significant contributions to the life of our church family. You're not alone. I care about you. Who's one person you can do that for this week? We're better together, aren't we? We're better together when we open doors for each other. We're better together when we show appreciation for each other. We're better together when we exhort each other. That's the third way we're better together. We exhort each other. You know, to exhort means to admonish or to warn. We may not always like to hear it, but we're always better off when people who are wiser and have more experience care enough to warn us about danger ahead, aren't we? You know, we've been hearing for the last, I don't know how many days now, about this solar eclipse that's coming tomorrow. There are all kinds of news stories about it, but it seems like at the end of every single news story about the eclipse, there's always an exhortation, isn't there? Don't look directly at the sun. You'll wreck your eyes. And you've been hearing it so frequently now, it's becoming annoying. But the, the motivation is a genuine concern to keep people from damaging their eyes by looking directly at the solar eclipse. Well, Paul takes a few verses before he closes his letter to warn the Romans about something. Look at verse 17, where he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but rather their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Paul has a lot of experience with such things. He knows that wherever the gospel goes, false teachers are close behind. They're sure to follow. And he says, you can recognize them because they create division. They, they will teach you doctrines that are contrary to what we've already taught you. They may pretend to serve Jesus, but they don't really. They only serve their own appetites. They're in it for their own profit. And they deceive a lot of naive people. Now, 
It's not that Paul expects the Roman believers to be led astray that way. He has better expectations of them. He just wants them to be alert to the danger. And so he feels it important to to express this warning. He says in verse 19, for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What's this crushing Satan under your feet thing? Well, it's probably referenced to Genesis 3.15, the first statement of the gospel in all of scripture, where God tells Adam and Eve that Satan, the serpent, will strike the heel of the offspring of Eve, but that offspring will crush Satan's head. That's a picture of what happened at the cross, isn't it? So Satan, you know, reaches out and, and tries to do in the Son of God and, and you know, is probably delighted to see Jesus hanging on the cross, not realizing that that very act of Jesus giving his life on the cross is the very thing that spells Satan's doom, that will bring him to a crushing defeat. And, and Paul is saying, look, the day of our ultimate victory in Christ over the powers of darkness is coming soon. The question we might ask is, why would Paul issue a warning like this to a church where he's never been? It's kind of gutsy to, to say, you know, hey, like an, like an old uncle saying, hey, uh, be careful about that now. Why does he do it? He does it because he cares about them. He doesn't want harm to come to them. You know, sometimes you might feel like a nag sounding a warning like this. And, and I think as Christians, sometimes we're reluctant to, you know, kind of, you know, sort of get in other people's business and, and warn them about things as if to say, you know, look, I, I, I don't want people to misunderstand. I want people to like me. So maybe I'll just keep quiet. But that's not really a loving thing, is it? If, if you really care about other believers, you'll warn them away from things that you see could be detrimental to them. It's a great story I came across this week about a kid named Jerome when he was 14 uh, and a freshman in high school. Their school had an early dismissal. He uh, neglected on purpose to tell his parents about the fact that he'd be coming home from school early and he brought home his girlfriend and they weren't going to be studying algebra. And so as they were coming up the steps, he said uh, the window to the neighbor's house flew open and out popped Mrs. Nolan saying, "Uh, you're home awful early, Jerome. To which he said, yes, ma'am. And then he improvised some lame story about how they had planned to do algebra problems together. Mrs. Nolan said, does your mother know that you're home this early? And maybe do you want me to call her for you? (laughs) To which Jerome responded by saying, no, ma'am and recognizing he'd been had, said, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave Kathy here on the front steps and I'll go in and call my mom. But here's what Jerome says about that incident many years later. He says, Mrs. Nolan saved our careers that day. If Kathy had gotten pregnant, she might not, not have become the doctor she is today. And my father had warned me that if I made a baby, the mutual fund he'd set up for me to go to college or to start a business would have gone to the child. I'm glad Mrs. Nolan was at her window looking out for me. That young man was better off for having a a neighbor like Mrs. Nolan who cared enough to confront him when she saw he was about to mess up. We're better off as believers to have caring people in our lives who love us enough to exhort us to stay away from what will damage our walk with Jesus. We're flat out better together than if we try to do the Christian life on our own, aren't we? We open doors for each other. We appreciate each other, we exhort each other, and fourthly and finally, we elevate each other. We raise each other's game. In the last three verses of today's passage, Paul passes on greetings from a circle of of men who are with him there in Corinth as he writes his letter. And the thing I want you to see as we work through these last few names in, in the passage is that there are no slouches among them. These are sharp people. Now, we don't know a lot about all of them, but the ones we do know anything about, we know enough to know that these are really impressive men. And I want you to understand that Paul, as a leader, was not afraid to surround himself with really impressive people, stars in their own right. You know, some leaders won't do that for fear of being overshadowed. Paul was not afraid to do that. Why? Because he knew what the book of Proverbs says, right? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. If you want to become the best you can be, surround yourself with other believers who are as sharp or sharper than you, and you will, and, and, and you will elevate each other. You will raise each other's game. Look at some of the men with whom Paul's keeping company here. Verse 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. 
Now we know about Timothy. He's well known to us from the book of Acts. Paul's son in the faith accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. Paul trusted him so much that he left uh, Timothy in charge of the church at Ephesus when Paul had to move on. You know that Timothy is listed as a co-author with Paul in six of Paul's epistles. And two other of Paul's epistles are written to Timothy. I think it's fair to say that Paul raised Timothy's game considerably, but I venture to guess Paul was a better man and a more effective servant of Christ for having mentored him as well, for having Timothy in his life. So he says, Timothy greets you. So does Lucius. You know who that is? Some scholars think it's Luke, Dr. Luke, who often accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys and wrote the gospel according to Luke. Who else? Uh, Jason greets you. Well, Jason may be the one mentioned in Acts 17 who saved Paul from a rioting mob and paid money to appease the authorities. Sosipater, my kinsman, greets you. Sosipater is a fellow Jew believed to be from Berea where the believers were known to be diligent students of the scriptures. Next, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. You're like, what? I thought Paul wrote this letter. Well, he did. Tertius is what's called an amanuensis, a secretary or a scribe. Uh, He would have been the professional scribe whose job it was to accurately and legibly record what Paul wanted said in the letter, which means he was a highly literate and skilled individual. He goes on to say, Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Gaius Titius Justus was a wealthy man in Corinth whose home was right next to the synagogue. He was one of the earliest believers. He extended hospitality to Paul. The whole church met in his house. He says, Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. Here's another impressive figure that we know from history. Paul calls him city treasurer. Before that, he may have held the job uh, director of public works in Corinth. The reason we know that is because in 1929, there was a marble paving stone that was discovered in the ruins of Corinth that had an inscription on it. And the inscription on the stone said, Erastus, commissioner of public works, laid this pavement at his own expense. And so we have a public servant, a man of some means, who is now part of Paul's contingent here. And then there's Quartus. Our brother Quartus greets you. Quartus is believed to be the brother of Tertius. Why? Tertius means third. Quartus means fourth. (laughs) Talk about lazy parenting. What are we going to name our kids? One, two, three, and four. (laughs) But what I want you to see here is is the the quality of people that Paul surrounds himself with, really sharp people. He wasn't worried that they'd make him look bad. He seemed to understand that they would all make each other better. You know, and that's been my experience too. Surround yourself with the best people you can because you'll make each other better for it. I told you last week that um, when I went to the seminary in 2007 to teach, I thought I'd spend 15 or more years there, finish out my career teaching other people how to preach. And uh, that worked out well for a year or two, and then things started to change, as I described last week. And then I came to Bayside, and for the first time in over 20 years, I didn't have a regular teaching gig when it came to teaching preaching. I'd been teaching preaching for over 20 years by that time. And I taught a course or two online after I I came to Bayside, but then those dried up because the seminary changed their curriculum and those courses weren't offered anymore. And so now there was no Bible college or seminary nearby for me to teach in. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of strange. First time in forever I've not taught preaching. And then I look around and I see this staff of young guys who are eager to learn, who've never had a preaching course. And so we've done my preaching courses here at Bayside for the staff and some others who, who uh, have, have found their way in. And, um, and it's, it's been fun for me to take the, the staff here through the very same classes that I would teach at the seminary level. And before anybody can get on the platform here and preach on a Sunday morning, they've got to have gone through my classes. And before they preach for the first time on a Sunday morning, we all sit and they preach to us and we give them feedback so that uh, they get feedback from us before they preach to you. And one of the most gratifying things of my time here at Bayside has been to hear you all say, wow, have we seen these guys grow as preachers. But, it's not just them, I've grown too. You know, I've preached through Romans uh, 
1987, 30 years ago, I preached through Romans, and I've got some of the tapes from back then. I've listened to some of those tapes. They were okay, okay sermons. They're not as good as, as the more recent sermons have been. You know why? Because I've got like a half dozen people who are sitting here th thinking, I wonder how Dave's gonna handle this passage. I, I know what he said in class. I is he gonna do it right? And so I've gotta be on the top of my game because every sermon I preach is, you know, I want it to be a model for, for these guys and, and, and for everybody who's taking my preaching classes so that they can see how, how to do it. And so we've elevated each other. We've raised each other's game as a result. We're better together. Whatever you do, when it comes to trying to live the Christian life, don't try to do this thing on your own. Paul's example in this section shows us that we are much better together. And if even the great apostle knew that he needed other people in his life as he walked the walk with Christ, how much more do we, right? You might say, well, where do I get started? I'm not really plugged in. Well, I'll tell you one great place to get started. Next month when we roll out our classes and groups for the fall, pick out a class or a group or two and jump right in with both feet, not just to learn, but to get connected to other Christians, to start rubbing shoulders, doing life together, get involved in a ministry, working alongside of other believers. We're, we'll all be the better for it if we're doing this thing together. We're just flat out better together. So here's your assignment for this week. You've got four, four different options to choose from. And if you're an overachiever, you can do all four. So assignment number one, open a door for a fellow believer by introducing them into your circle of friends or introducing them into an opportunity that they wouldn't have on their own. Open a door for someone. Two, show appreciation for another believer. Let them know they matter. Let them know they're not alone. Let them know that they're loved without strings. Let them know they're appreciated. Or third, dare to exhort someone you think may be headed for trouble. You know, maybe you're sitting back thinking, oh, I don't wanna get involved, I don't want them to think I'm a nag. But if you see a fellow believer who, who's really headed for trouble, would you care enough about them to speak up? We're better together when we exhort each other. Or fourth, resolve to hang out more with the women or with the men in your life who bring out the very best in you. The people who bring out the best in each other. You know, occasionally I'll hear somebody say that they've walked away from church, but not from God, they said. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, they say. Well, that statement is certainly open to debate. But even if you could prove that it's technically true, the real question is, why would you want to? Why would you want to go it alone as a Christian when we're so much better together? Let's stand as we pray. Lord, we stand before you together, a group of believers, followers of Jesus. And some of us may be feeling a little disconnected right now. Some of us may be feeling a little unappreciated. Lord, I pray that, that you would help those who feel unappreciated to just bring another believer into their life who will speak words of encouragement to them. To those who feel unconnected, I pray that you will just open doors of relationship for them to be solidly connected with other believers who will care about them. Lord, we, uh, we don't wanna do this thing alone. We, we love the church, we love the body of Christ with all of its wonderful diversity. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to do this thing we call church well for the good of each and every believer, but also for the good of a world who is watching and needs to know the Savior. And it's in his name that we go out today to bring him glory. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.